for joining us today. My name is Ian Scott, and I am the managing partner at Scott Legal. And today we are going to talk about the EB-5 program, and we're going to look at this program in terms of direct EB-5 investment, and also going to look at this in terms of regional center investment. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Scott Legal is a full-service immigration law firm. We do a number of investor visas, including EB-5. We also do E-2 and another a number of other employment-based visa categories. We also do family-based and some humanitarian-based visas as well. Um, in terms of the webinar, there are going to be a few things that we send to you at the end of the webinar. We'll send you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go through. The webinar is being recorded, so we will send you a link where you'll be able to watch the webinar again on our YouTube channel. We do encourage you to sign up for our YouTube channel. We regularly post educational immigration videos, and if you subscribe, you'll get a notification every single time that we post a video. We will also send you a link to a consultation, just a link that where you're able to set up a consultation if you have additional questions about the EB-5 program. Uh, if you have any questions during the process, please feel free to add them to the Q&A uh, box or the chat uh, box, and we will get to all questions. Um, sometimes not right when you ask them, but by the, we do save some time at the end of the presentation to go over any questions that you have. So without further ado, let us move into EB, the EB-5 program. And before we get into the specifics of the requirements, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the regional center program and the direct investment program, and really maybe talk about it in terms of what the uh, uh, profile of an individual who wants to engage in one of these pro uh, programs would look like. So for the regional center uh, program, you normally have an individual that is interested in a very passive form of investment that really does not want to um, have much control over hiring people or uh, managing the business, but really wants to invest the requisite amount and uh, you know not really have much else to do other than you know after they've made that um, after they've made that investment. The uh, regional center program, it's the, the way it's made up is, for example, it might be something like a hotel chain that decides that they want to build a large hotel property and they say that, well, we would like to finance that through EB-5 investors. So we're going to attract 100 investors to give us money. And those 100 investors are interested in the green card. So really all they're doing is giving the money and they don't have really any, any impact on the day-to-day -day business operations. And uh, that's how that uh, that's work now works. Now, what the the cost is quite high. These regional centers usually have administrative fees and very low returns. Usually, it's a fraction of a percent. So the people who are doing these are really doing them just for the green card. It is an investment, but when you do this type of investment, you're getting either a limited partnership unit or some other form of equity. And it is an investment just like any other investment. So it is risky in the sense that you could lose all of your investment and not get the green card. That has happened to some people, but um, it's that's why it's important if you're looking at a regional center program to work with an investment advisor and find a regional center program that uh, maybe has a good reputation, has been around for a while, and has, um, has had lots of approvals and even given people their money back. The other big difference between a regional center and direct investment is that indirect jobs can be counted. So one of the key things with the EB-5 program is that you have to hire 10 full-time workers and the uh, regional center program can count indirect jobs. So let's say that hotel chain that I talked about as a result of the hotel being put in, that there's going to be a dry cleaner down the street, or there's going to be a mall, and all of these other indirect jobs that uh, stem from the fact that there is this hotel can be accounted in the job creation numbers. And uh, as I said, the applicant in this case just wants to get the green card. Under the direct investment program, um, the individuals here really are interested in having control over their own destiny and control over the uh, you know the entire process. So they normally have their own business. Sometimes they can be on an E two visa, and um, they have a business, and then they invest more money, or they've already invested the requisite amount of money. Um, they want to control their own destiny. They want to control their own, own return, and they want to manage the business. So. The other big difference here is only direct jobs are counted. And the other thing is that the regional center program is subject to regular reauthorization by Congress. So that does create some risk. And it did in the past, for example, when the program didn't get reauthorized on a timely basis. But uh, 
the um, but you know, but but I think that it's uh, it's the one good thing about direct investment is that that doesn't have to be reauthorized, and uh, that's kind of always ongoing. So something to keep to keep in mind. So let's jump into now then the actual EB five requirements. The EB five has kind of maybe two big categories in terms of in terms of requirements. The first category is investment. So you have to invest either eight hundred thousand or a million and fifty thousand dollars, and the difference is going to be uh, in whether or not where the business is located. So if the business is located in what's called a targeted employment area, so that's either a rural area or an area where the unemployment rate is at least one point five times the national average, so just over six percent then you're going to invest a lower investment amount. If not, you would invest a higher investment amount. And um, you do have to be careful, you know, in terms of it's 800,000 or a million and 50, but they are pretty specific in particular with respect to what can be included. So for example, none of that money can go towards legal fees and things like that. So um, they are pretty, pretty like an administrative fee. So if you are doing the regional center and there is a 30 or $40,000 administration fee, then you would have to invest 830 or 840,000 um, plus the legal fees uh, to, to be able to do that. The um, investment does not all be made at once, but it does have to be made before you file the application. So um, you, 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 before you file the I-526 petition, you would have made the investment, but it can be made over time. And the other thing to kind of keep in mind, and this is in particular if you have the situation where you're in direct investment and let's say you had an E2 and you had a business that was operational, let's say the business made uh, money and let's say a couple million dollars and it was sitting in retained earnings. And then you said, okay, well, the next year I'm going to spend that and then I'm going to apply for EB-5. That does not work. The money has to be money that you uh, have possession and control of outside of the uh, business and then you investing that into the business. Um, there are a lot of differences between E2 and EB-5. E2 is country specific. That's one difference. E2 um, allows you to purchase a business. That's another difference. EV5, the, the money has to be linked to job creation. So generally speaking, purchasing a business doesn't qualify. The source of funds is also quite different. They both have a similarly worded requirement that you have to show where the money came from, that it came from a legitimate source, a lawful source. But the EB-5 is more like an audit. So it really is not for the faint of its heart because it is a, it, you know, that requirement is quite... Uh, uh, quite quite significant in terms of um, in terms of uh, meeting the requirement, and it's really the key the key focus in EB five regional central petition, and it's also a big focus even when you're doing direct in investment. So a lot of things to look out for there. Uh, the investment does have to be some type of equity, so it can't be like a loan or something like that. Um, and then the big other now, so that's investment. So the other big piece of EB five is job creation, and you have to create ten full time jobs. And uh, the, these have to be full-time jobs and so not part-time, and they have to be jobs for US citizens or green card holders. So we do recommend anybody who's doing the direct investment program in particular to uh, utilize something called E-Verify so that you know that the people that you're hiring actually are people who have legitimate green cards or are legitimate citizens of the United States, because that is something that the government will check when you do um, go back to prove to them that you've actually created the U.S. jobs. So you would have, um, you know, they will approve an EB-5 petition based on a business plan. So the business plan has to be detailed and matter of matter of ho. This is the, the case that deals with this. It has to be a credible business plan. And um, also, if you're doing direct investment, you can't just kind of put money in a bank account and just leave it there and then apply. You would have to have commitments against that and also... Um, commitments against that, and you know, have actually spent some of the money, um, spent some of the money as, as well. Um, so, just in terms of the petitions that are filed, this is um, there. There are kind of three main petitions that are filed. So, the first is I five two six, and that shows that you've invested the money, the eight hundred thousand or the million and fifty thousand. The second is, um, and that you have the ability to create the jobs. The second is either going to be consular processing. So if you're outside of the United States, you would be processing this at a consulate. Or if you're inside the United States, you may have the ability to file what's called an I-485 petition, which is adjustment of status. And the benefit of the I-485 is that you can um, be in the United States and you can apply for work authorization and travel authorization if you file that to a particular form. So that's something to keep, uh, keep, keep, keep in mind. And then two years after you get the green card, you have to file a petition called an IA29 petition, 
and the IA29 petition is a petition where it's a removal of the conditions um, and uh, showing, so it's really showing that you actually have created the 10 full-time jobs. So the, um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of information there, but, um, you know, definitely a lot to, uh, you know, a lot to, 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 to accomplish to be able to apply for the EB-5. But again, think of it broadly as breaking it out into investment and creating jobs. So there were some changes to the program. This was in March, 2022. And um, the, the, the few changes, so one, the, the, program was reauthorized. So this is the Region Center program until September 30th, 2027. Um, the filings before the 20, September 30th, 2026 will be adjudicated because this was a big problem last time when the program stalled. It was a really, really big problem because USCIS did not know whether they could continue to adjudicate, so they just decided to stall. Um, in terms of the big change was the uh, investment amount before was 500,000, it was increased to 800. And the other investment about the higher one used to be in 1 million, it was only increased to 1 million 50,000. So that one wasn't as big of a change. And then there was a change to the TEA rules um, to make it harder to qualify because it was um, for the lower amount because that was uh, there was quite a bit of abuse that was, was happening there. And then another big change is this uh, called the set aside. Um, and the set aside was something that it's, it's a carve out that basically says we're going to reserve 32% of the visas for rural areas, unemployment, high unemployment and infrastructure projects. And this was really helpful because it um, allows for individuals who otherwise uh, don't have a current category, and that's going to be nationals from China or India, to kind of jump the line really and be, um, be, be able to apply for the green card faster. So. Um, you'll see that almost all regional center projects are in either rural areas or high unemployment areas. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's made it so that nationals from China or India do not have nearly as long of a wait. So like I mentioned before that when you file the I-485, you can now file the, the, the work opposition, travel opposition. This was a big change because before the I-485 couldn't be filed until the I-526 had been approved. So that was this huge change in March of 2022, which gives a lot of people the ability to stay in the United States while the long process is pending. And we're going to talk a lot, we'll talk a little bit about these delays as well. They also clarified gifts and loans and said that the, that they were possible, that the, you know that that was that was uh, that was possible and. Um, the, oh, there was also some wording related to to um, changing the program if the regional center did in fact uh, did in fact fail. Some other things to consider. Uh, I mentioned this already. If you're doing a direct investment um, EB five, then you can't just put money in a bank account and then apply. You do have to have commitments and or spent uh, a good good part of the money. Uh, we talked about loans and, and gifts. Loans can be from anyone. The gift can be from anyone. If you do have a gift, you want to make sure that you have paid the, the person who's given the gift has paid the, the gift tax because because of the time these petitions are taking, the government might come back and ask about that. Loans can be unsecured or they can be secured against your personal property. If they're secured against your personal property, the government will want source of funds information related to your personal property. The only loans that don't work are loans that are secured against the actual business, the EB-5 business. And then I mentioned this earlier as well, is that EB-5 doesn't really work when you're purchasing a business. Um, so that's um, that's something that, that you know, kind of puts off a lot of people or they're surprised at because it does work for E2, but not for EB-5 because the government says that it doesn't um, uh, doesn't to help with job creation. There's no requirement with respect to how much you own, so it can be a fraction of a percent for EB-5, that's not a problem. And you can't have any kind of guarantee of or return of the investment, um, any guarantees in the paperwork. So you really have to do, make sure that you're paying attention to the language of the uh, documents to make sure that there is no guarantee uh, for, for that kind of thing. And the, um, we, I think we talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, so some things that might count for E2 won't count for EB5, purchasing a business, the administrative fees and things like that. Um, and then the, the big one I think is when you're buying a business. Okay, so I think that we're going to go to some other considerations um, now as well with, and so, so one big consideration is timing. 
So uh, the timing consideration is that EB-5 petitions take a long time to be adjudicated. Sometimes they can take four or five years to be adjudicated. And the reason, that's one of the reasons that the benefit of having the um, ability to file the I-485 petition is great because people get all the benefits of the green card, or most of the benefits of the green card, while they're waiting that four or five years. And then, as I mentioned, there are country-specific quotas. So China and India, unless you're in one of those reserved categories, um, the wait for the green card is going to be quite significant. Um, so, um, so, so that's something to keep keep in mind. And that's why normally what we see is that um, normally what we see is people that um, apply in, in, in particular for most countries uh, using the high unemployment category so that they get the carve out so that their category is actually current. Um, you do have to, because of the, the long wait as well, I think you do have to really be conscious of the time that you're in the United States um, because you have to make sure that you are uh, maintaining your status and that you have actually uh, things in place, whether it's a visa to maintain your status, and you have to look at that visa and say, okay, well, is it a dual intent visa like an H-1B or an L, or is it not like a TN or an E, and that, that's going to impact your decision. We do some, sometimes see people taking parallel green card strategies where they are, um, you know, they might start with an EB-5 and then marry a U.S. citizen, and uh, they, you know, you can, you can be applying for multiple green cards at the same time, whichever one works out best for you you can take and the and I think that the the key thing is really is really planning. I think planning is is the key the key thing that you um you have to you have to look at. So um those were all the prepared remarks I wanted to cover and um let's just take a look see if there are any questions. Actually I do see one question here. What are some strategies I can follow to source eight hundred thousand funds um, is SDIRA a good option? I'm not sure what that is. Can a preliminary applicant tap into dependence SDIRA? Um, yeah, it's an acronym. Unless someone's familiar with it, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, so what happens to applicant if Congress does not renew the EB-5 program in the future? Okay, that's a different question. So the first question is just, um, you know, this, for source of funds, um, I, I don't know what this, this particular um, uh, reference relates to, but for sources of funds, you first have to kind of say, okay, well, where did the money come from? Did the money come from savings? Did it come from selling a property? Did it come from a gift loan? And, and then you have to kind of look at that and see if you can prove that the the source of funds is um, is, is legitimate. Um, if the applicant, if Congress doesn't renew the, the program in the future, well, that goes back to that date that I mentioned that they they actually are permitted to adjudicate applications as long as they're filed by um, September of 2026. So that's um, that's that's not a problem. Now it's not. in the past when the program didn't get reauthorized, it it it, it was a problem. <laughs> um, it was it was a problem. Um, because um, yeah, it was a problem because um, the the USCIS just stopped for adjudicating the petitions. Uh, can I go the next question? I can I go back to H one B non immigrant visa after my petition is approved but fail to create ten jobs to mitigate immigration risk? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. You could go back to H one B. H one B is a dual intent visa. So um, if you if you you know apply for the green card and then didn't get it for some reason and you had an H one B, you could still utilize the H one B. Um, I think that's it for questions. I think that's it for questions. Um, but again, yeah. So again, we will send you a copy of the um, the. the PowerPoint, the video, or we also have an EB-5 guide that we will send you and a link to a consultation that, um, a link to a consultation that will, um, will um, be, you know, be there in case you have any additional questions to, to, to ask. Um, so there's just one other question that came in here. Can two EB-5 also qualify with the total investment of one million? So the investment amount is 800,000. So um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but the the so a few things. One, if one person applies, then the spouse and children obviously get a green card as well. If you mean can two people apply investing 1.6, you know, so that's you know, like the, then 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 depends what you mean, because the if it's a direct investment, that's another one of the big changes. If it's a direct investment. 
then the only only one person per company can get the green card. Um, so if you want more people to get the green card, that would have to be through a regional center. That was another one of the changes they made in March. Perfect. So again, thank you very much for joining and um, happy to, to, to hear, uh, to answer any questions during the consultation. Thank you.